This is an overview of SAIT, which is a component for displaying transcripts, that is, the written record of meetings. I'm Dave Whiteland from My Society, and I'm going to show you SAIT. I'm going to explain why it's so useful and why we built it, and then I'll go into a little more detail about how you can use it, and then we'll have a quick look at some of the technical things you can do to put your own documents into SAIT. So this is what I'm going to run through. First some examples, and then a case study. We'll have a quick look at how to make your own say it, both manually and by importing speeches. And finally, uh, a brief look at the Acoma and Toza XML standard we use for this, and a very brief introduction to parsing. Right, let's jump right in with an example. This is the trial of Charles Taylor, former president of Liberia. And these are the transcripts of his trial where he was accused of war crimes and crimes against humanity by the Special Court for Sierra Leone. This is Say It presenting the details of the first hearing. I can click on a speaker and it will show me a collection of all their speeches, statistics about them. You can see this is uh, Richard Lusick was involved in uh, many of the hearings. Or I can search across all the transcripts. This jumps into a specific mention inside one of the other uh, hearings. Here's another example. This is the People's Assembly Parliamentary Monitoring website for South Africa. The activity of the South African Parliament is recorded in Hansard, and the group running this site, PMG, take the uh, proceedings of Hansard and put them into Say It. You see this looks a little different because this time we're looking at say it running as an embedded part of a larger website. In this case if I click on a um, speaker it will take me through to the page on the parent website. Right away you might think that this is just a tiny bit boring and there are more exciting things to put on the internet than the minutes of meetings. So let's put this in context, the context of civic tech. It turns out that pretty much everything you can and cannot do in your life has been decided by powerful people in a meeting. Local government, parliament, courtrooms, these are all meetings whose outcomes affect normal people. You might not think about this much, but it's pretty much how the bureaucracies that we use to run our societies work. And one of the purposes of civic tech is giving citizens the ability to know about these processes. Because once you know what's going on, you can hold your representatives to account and ultimately influence or change them. The old knowledge is power thing. Well, the outcomes of the meetings that shape the societies we live in are things like laws and bills and timetables, budgets, and even court verdicts or prison sentences. These are often very important things, but the process by which they happen is nowhere near as widely shared as accessible to the people it is affecting, and certainly not as much as we think it should be. So here's a third example, and this time I'll show you the problem we're really addressing with Say It by looking at the original document too. This is the Leveson inquiry into the culture, practices and ethics of the British press. The public hearings for this were held in 2011 and 2012. Some key things to bear in mind. Firstly, this was a parliamentary inquiry funded by public money. Secondly, although the public at the time knew the inquiry was going on, a lot of it was critical of the behaviour of the press, especially the tabloid press, which of course had no interest in reporting on it. And finally, the result of the inquiry was published as a report but there's an important thing here. The transcripts of the whole inquiry, the actual details of everything that was said, they were also published. So I'm going to show you how the inquiry published the hearings. It's telling that actually the end result is really a paper document. Let's have a look. This is the official website of the Leveson inquiry. I can look at the hearings and pick a day that I'm interested in. For example, Thursday the 24th of November, when J.K. Rowling gave evidence to the committee. Here's the transcript of that session. Now on a pedantic level, the document is digital, because it's a PDF, but it's really just paper behind glass. And let me show you what we mean when we use that term, because it's important to understand what's really wrong here. 
In this case, and the Leveson inquiry is especially poor because of it, you can see that there are four pages on each PDF page. This only makes sense when printed out on paper. PDF viewers know about pages, but this layout even manages to break that. It's actually a staggeringly user-hostile way of laying out a document. It makes it hard to read. And that's somewhat astonishing when the purpose of producing the document in the first place ought to be to let people to read it. It turns out it's a hostile way to lay out a document from a machine reading point of view too, because it makes parsing it harder, although these transcripts were also made available as text files. Now notice the line numbers. That's an attempt to allow deep linking, because you can refer to any utterance by quoting its page and line number. Again, that makes sense on paper. Well, it would if page really meant anything in this case. And in fact, it's a successful medieval technology, and it's been done this way in Bibles for over a thousand years. But the important, important point here is that this is a form of deep linking in a technology that does not support it. You can't link directly to a place within the PDF. And in fact, even if you know the page and line number, you still can't jump there using PDF's mechanism for page or search. The whole thing basically prevents digital linking, which on one level is just annoying. But from a civic tech point of view, it's actually a real way to lessen the usefulness of this document. Because if you can't deep link, you can't cite, you can't share, you can't show specific utterances. You can only refer to the whole document. And that pretty much stops details in the document being called out in debate, in social media, or in any sensible way online. So here's what we did. We parsed that PDF, isolated every speech, identified each speaker, and recorded how it was all linked together, and put that into a database. Sayit can then reconstruct that structured data to produce the pages of the website that you're looking at now. This is Sayit's presentation of the Leveson Inquiry. I can look at the session we were just looking at. This time you see it's clearer, easier to read, broken down by speaker. Of course, I can investigate the individual speaker's contributions. But perhaps more usefully, and a key point, is that this supports deep linking. If I get the link in context, you can see there is a URL here which I can share, which will drop somebody into the document at the utterance that I'm interested in sharing or here directly just just to the speech and of course with this I can share it in Twitter on Facebook in blog posts in newspaper articles so now you have a good understanding of what say it is doing and why it matters let's start with a simple example of making your own say it site my society currently runs a hosted version which means you can add a say it site which we sometimes call an instance without needing to worry about installing the software yourself So here I'm going to create a new site. I'm already logged in. And it's created a new instance. Right, let me add my first statement to this instance. It's going to be the March Hare saying, have some wine. You'll see that Say It has created the speaker, so I can edit to give a little more information. For example, I've got a picture of, uh, of the hair. And in this case, I can use March Hair as, is, as the name so that the doesn't get considered when sorting the, the speakers into lists. So that's already a bit better. Actually, I can add a section, which is just uh, which is just a way of organising um, uh, speeches. We saw them separately as um, hearings in the trials that we've looked at before. I can move the speech that I've put. So here we go. 
looking at the speeches now under Tea Party. Have a start. Let me add another speech. And this says to the hair, I don't see any wine. I can add a picture for Alice. And see how we're getting on now. The tea party is starting to take shape. And you can see I can build up um, the transcript of the meeting in this in this way. And now, obviously, this is quite a laborious way of doing it. So let's have a quick look to see what we've ended up with. So clearly, that's quite a laborious way to enter. Uh, all the text of a meeting. And although there are advantages to doing it that way, um, you could crowdsource, for example, you can nominate other people who you're going to give right access to your transcript so they can work on it at the same time. But there is another way, and that is to import the speeches. The way this works is, say it will consume a document which contains the transcript of the meeting that you're trying to show provided it's in a format that it knows how to accept and that format is uh, an XML standard called Acoma and Toso which I'm going to show you now. In fact the easiest way to, to see this is to look at the um, text that we've already got here's the Tea Party and actually say it will expose the underlying XML. This is the Akoma and Toza XML format of the Tea Party. You can see at the top the whole thing is wrapped in a debate tag. There are references to each of the speakers which you can see here are given an ID. There are four. I've added the Dormouse as an extra one. And then within the debate body you can see each speech is credited to an ID which matches one of the IDs in the reference section at the top. So if you're familiar with XML this won't seem very complicated and if you've seen any HTML you'll recognize some of what's going on inside as well. So really in order to um, populate a say it the challenge is to get your speech document into this XML format. Now we're using Acoma and Tosa because it's an open standard that is um, increasingly widely used in parliamentary and legislative documents. Uh, it's used by the Library of Congress in the US, uh, the Italian government, the European Union. Acoma and Tosa itself can get quite complicated, but we're using a small subset of it, uh, which is pretty much summarized from what you're seeing here. So to show how that works, I'll make a new demo say it. I'll uh, import the speeches. It wants to know a source of uh, a coma and toza. So let me use this URL. So I'm actually importing uh, the speech for the point of demonstration from another site. And here we go. Now this instance is populated with the speeches from the Acoma and Tosa file. Now you'll notice that the speakers didn't come across. That is because actually speakers are a separate data set which we could import uh, separately. In fact, there are several ways of doing that, and we use the Popolo JSON format. And 
we'll look perhaps a, a, at another time at Poppet, which is another populist component which exports data of people. Uh, quite often this is uh, parliamentary people, so it's useful for speeches in SAIT, um, into your SAIT. Now a thing that I want to um, uh, finish by pointing out is we've glossed over a little about how you get your Acoma and Toso XML because normally you're starting with a transcript uh, or a record of a meeting which might be a PDF or a Word document or even video or audio. At some point that needs to be transcribed into text which then gets converted into the XML format which say it can import. Now the extreme case of what that may look like is something like this. This is the original text of uh, the uh, Tea Party that I've been using as, as, as an example from the Project Gutenberg. So actually, in one sense, this is the original document. This is the text from which Say It is getting its own. A simpler way to look at that is the same meeting described as a script. I did this by hand by reading the original text and converting it into this format. Now if you can understand that process, which as a human reader is fairly straightforward, you can see it's not a great leap to do a similar thing here. It's just the script marked up in XML. The catch, of course, is how you go about writing such a parser. The point that uh, we want to make just in this short um, demonstration is that the technical format of the source document, whether in this case it's HTML or the um, it might be a PDF or a Word file. Actually, that's that's a small part of the problem because by and large there are technical ways to get to the text content of those documents. The problem of parsing really becomes how you identify where a speaker is speaking. So in this case, if this was your source document, to turn this into XML, it wouldn't be too difficult to write a script that looked for a name in capital letters followed by a colon and assumed that what follows is a quotation until the next token which looks like a speaker. This works fine of course until you hit uh, something else with capitals and a colon or if your source document is more complicated. Here's an example. You can see you can probably identify where people are speaking by the use of the quotations. But it gets a little complicated because sometimes we've got things going on here where Alice is thinking, not speaking. So what I'm drawing attention to is the fact that parsing a, a transcript, parsing a document to put it into something like Say It, is not just a technical problem, it actually starts to become a semantic problem as well. Which is why when we're asked, can you put this document for us into Say It, it actually depends a lot. Not when we talk about the format of the document, not just on the technical format of it, but the arrangement of the text and the ordering within it, the way that the different tokens, semantic tokens, speakers and speeches are represented. So that's it. Say it is free software for presenting transcripts of meetings online. We'll host it for you, but if you prefer, you can install it yourself. Instructions for that are on the project website. We looked at how you can enter your transcripts by hand, or better still, how you can import them using the Acoma and Toso XML format. And we also briefly looked at parsing, and how when you're turning your document into the XML format, this can be straightforward or complicated, depending on the nature of the document you're starting with. If you have any questions, please join the Poplus group and ask on the mailing list. We look forward to welcoming you.